I, uh, I spoke at TechEd one year, and they had me do, I forget, some session on PowerShell. And I, I set my MacBook up on the podium, and one of the little flunkies immediately runs over. Could you make sure you tell everyone that's really running Windows? OK. Um, it isn't. That's just a virtual machine. Is that OK? We'd really rather it not be. Are you authorized to talk to a member of the press on behalf of Microsoft Corporation? <laughs> they scurry off. <laughs> Good. All right, so let's start. Let's actually, who wants to start with desired state configuration? Good, me too. <laughs> um, I, the thing is, is I've, I've, had, I've had my head buried in DSC for the better part of a, a, a quarter now. Um, you guys know who Steve Mirowski is, right? Uh, Steve is a fellow MVP. Steve works for Stack Exchange. Steve's here this week. Uh, he's doing a lot of talks on desired state configuration. We actually have him back here in Bellevue at the Microsoft Convention Center in August for Tech Mentor, where he's doing six or nine hours on DSC because Stack Exchange uses this booger in production. So he knows exactly how it works and where all the rough edges are. And he's been really instrumental in helping me put together the DSC book. You guys know what the DSC book is? If you have not gone up to powershell.org slash WP slash ebooks, you need to get yourself up there at some point because that's where we keep all of our free ebooks. And uh, the DSC book is one of them. It's about a 50 page volume at this point. We're continually adding to it. Uh, we've actually got all these things moved over to a OneDrive account. So you can just view them right in your web browser and dump them to a PDF or download the raw Word document, whatever you want to do. It's awesome. I love OneDrive. And uh, DSC, DSC is designed to, to solve a couple of problems. Let's talk about why it's important, though. Because a lot of uh, Microsoft, do you, do you notice that Microsoft suddenly, in the past two years, has gotten a lot better with technology, and they suddenly started to suck at marketing, which is weird because it used to be the other way around. Like they had just terrible buggy products, but they, they sounded great. The commercials were awesome. Um, now it's like they, they don't even know how to market what they do. And what they do is brilliant. So here's the path. Uh, later this week, Jeffrey Snover is going to be doing a talk on the Monad Manifesto, which was something he wrote, gosh, probably pushing a decade ago now. I think he wrote it back in 02, maybe more than that. And it's where he kind of sat down and said, here are the problems that Microsoft has from an administering the technology perspective. And here's how I believe we fix it. And then he said, Unix, 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 a lot. Uh, and he wrote this thing called the Monad Manifesto. And it was basically four things. And, and I want you to think about these four things. The first thing he said is, we need an easily composable, syntactically consistent command line language, a way to, from a command line, tell our products what to do. And it's got to be complete coverage. In other words, when somebody wants to do something, they have to be able to do it from the command line. Now, we need to be able to build GUIs on top of that. This sound familiar? That was version one of PowerShell. He said, now, the next evolution of that is we need to be able to send those commands to multiple remote machines so we can tell 20 machines to do something as easily as telling one machine. That's remoting. That was PowerShell version 2. Then PowerShell version 3 came along and introduced workflow, which was nowhere in the manifesto. Doesn't count. The last thing he said, though, the, the, the ultimate expression of all this, the point of it all, was an ability to write a script that, instead of telling the computer what to do, told the computer what to look like. I want you to wear a blue shirt. I don't know how that happens. I don't care. That's what I want. And that's what desired state configuration is. So Windows Management Framework 4 completes that whole PowerShell monad manifesto. And the idea behind it is, ironically, Someone who has very little PowerShell experience can now be extremely effective in configuring computers because all they do is they write a configuration file. I'm not even going to call it a script. They write, they write a glorified INI file. Let's be honest and call it what it is. They write an INI file 
And under the hood, all these PowerShell commands are running to make it happen. So Snover's, Snover's uh, analogy is the configuration file is Picard. Make it so. And DSC is Riker. On it, boss. And he makes it happen. So with very little power, because of the investment in PowerShell now, because there's so much PowerShell that can touch so many things, those can be bundled up and surfaced through DSC so that somebody can write a very simplistic configuration file and make some incredibly complicated things actually happen. Now there are several layers in this stack and we're going to talk about what those layers are and we're going to dive into every single one of them to, to one degree or another. Uh, and I'll let you know what the capabilities are. But understand that, how many of you have any familiarity with Chef or Puppet? Anything like that? A little bit? They kind of work along the same lines. But they do it in a proprietary fashion. Meaning if you're a Chef guy, you're stuck with Chef. If you're a Puppet guy, you're kind of stuck with Puppet. They have a proprietary agent that gets installed, and they send a proprietary language. Now, it's, it's Python. I believe both of them. Puppet's Python. Ruby, Ruby uh, is Chef. Ruby is Chef, yeah. Uh, so the language itself is, is, is open enough, but how it's structured is proprietary, specific to each of those products. And then to make it actually do anything, you have to have little modules down on, on the, the, the node. So if you want to configure files, there's got to be a module that knows how to do that. If you want it to do Active Directory, there's got to be a module that knows how to touch that technology. Well, DSC does all that, but it does it from a non-proprietary viewpoint. Now, I want you to wrap your heads around that for a second. Microsoft <laughs> has created a configuration technology that is inherently cross-platform and does not rely on any proprietary anything. Meaning, despite the fact that there's a lot of PowerShell in this in it, you can do this thing cross-platform because it relies entirely on open standards that Microsoft didn't invent. They're just using, and this isn't the embrace and extend, they're using as documented standards. Like I don't, I, I don't, where did Microsoft go? Uh, well, this is what happens when you put a Unix guy in charge of product architecture, apparently. So, Let's, let's dig into the beginning of this because there's several different layers. Uh, here, let's, ISE is probably the easiest way to do this. Wow, this product could not possibly be any slower. Okie dokie. All right. Uh, the top section here is a configuration. This is the INI file. Let's talk about this architecturally, and then we'll get into the syntax second. You start with this configuration. That is actually a type of PowerShell command. Now, you guys know we got multiple types of commands, right? We got functions. That's a command. A commandlet. Another type of command. A workflow is a type of command. Well, a configuration is too. When I run this, PowerShell is going to spew a plain text file called a MOF. It is a management object format file. MOF is an industry standard. The layout of a MOF is determined by a, a standard created by the Distributed Management Task Force, or DMTF. The upside of that, the whole point of that, the moral of the story is, so long as you can get a valid MOF, you're good to use DSC. You do not have to write a PowerShell script to produce a MOF. This is one way to produce a MOF. You can have any other tool in the universe that you want spew a MOF. For example, I predict that there will be a version of System Center Configuration Manager with a big graphical front endy thing that spews MOFs under the hood. And I don't necessarily think it's going to have a PowerShell script as an intermediate step. I think it will be able to spew MOFs natively. So however you get them off, you're good. You give them off to a target machine. We're going to call these nodes because we've got a lot more than just computers now, right? We got all kinds of devices that might potentially be managed this way, so we're going to use generic terminology. You give them off to a node. There's two ways to get it there. We'll talk about that in a second. For right now, the Miracle Ferry gets it there, and it's there. On the managed node, there is a piece of software called the Local Configuration Manager, the LCM, 
It reads them off. And in the MOF, there are sections. Configure this to look like this. Configure this to look like this. Do this to this. It runs through each of those. And then under the hood, it calls a DSC resource to actually make it happen. DSC resources are PowerShell script modules. That's it. Just simple PowerShell script modules. They are easy peasy to put together. I'm going to show you a couple. So you can write your own. You can get them from Microsoft. Here's how easy they are. Because Microsoft's already invested in making all the PowerShell commands available, the PowerShell team with like one or two guys has been able to spew out three or four dozen resources in less than six months. So our coverage of what DSC can do is expanding geometrically. Plus, because it's just a script module, it's very easy for schmucks like me and Steve Murawski to write these things. So PowerShell.org has got a GitHub re repo with a bunch of DSC resources that Steve uses in production because Stack Exchange believes everything should be open source. And so they take their own management tools and give them to us. So these things are really, really easy and straightforward. So those are the three pieces of the stack. MOF, the LCM, which reads them off and calls resources, and the resources, which actually make things happen. Now let's talk versions. All of this requires WMF 4, Windows Management Framework 4, PowerShell 4, if you want to shortcut it. Meaning whatever machine you offer these on has to have PowerShell 4, Whatever machine you push these to has to have PowerShell 4. Everything has to have PowerShell 4. What version does it have to have? 4. four. So people seemed unclear about that at first, so I'm just, it has to be 4. That means Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1. It means Windows Server 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2. Right? No freaking XP. Let it go. We're done. So once you're on version 4, you get all this. Now these resources, you have to have the resources installed on the machine where you author the config and on any machines where the config will be pushed, where, wherever you deploy. So all your managed nodes need to have the resources that actually do whatever you want them to do. We're going to talk about the easy way to make that happen in a bit. It's just a file copy. They're, they're just scripts, so it's a file copy. They, they live. They live in C, Program Files, Windows PowerShell, Modules. Uh, XPS Desired State Configuration is a PowerShell DSC resource. That's one of them. Uh, the ones that come with the OS live under Win uh, System32 someplace in the PowerShell installation folder. The ones you add, you put here. In PowerShell 4, this is now in the PS module path environment variable, which means other modules can live here. This, isn't just, this is all Windows PowerShell modules. A DSC looks a little bit different because it's essentially got an empty root module and a DSC resources folder that actually holds the individual DSC resources. But you just file copy them there. That's one way to get them there. There's better ways, and we'll cover them in a sec. So let's talk about syntax now. What you're looking at is a configuration. It has a name. When I'm ready to generate the moth, I run that name. That's the only reason it has a name. You could call it Fred or Dino or whatever you want to call it. Doesn't matter. I'm calling it server type A. There are a lot of different strategies for producing these things, and we will dive across some of those strategies a little bit later. For right now, let's just keep the syntax simple like this one. Under the configuration, in that configuration block, you may legally have one or more node blocks. You may also define input parameters, just like a function. And you can have all the PowerShell logic in the universe. If, loops, whatever. For example, I can make a parameter block here. So now when I run this, I have to pass it a computer name. You could pass it multiple computer names. 
You can query computer names from Active Directory or from a, a, a configuration management database. Wherever the computer names come from, they can now be fed to this, and it will produce, when it runs, one moth file for each computer name you gave it. Because you can only send one moth file to a computer. So everything that that computer needs has to be in one moth file. We'll talk about some ways to, to make that easier. So you can have logic. You can also have node. The, the node block is what actually creates a moth. You can have multiple node blocks. Each node block will result in one moth per node. Now, if I give it multiple computer names, it'll generate one moth for each of them. Inside the node, you may have any PowerShell logic you want variables, if, loops, whatever, and you have configuration settings. So this is a setting. This relies on the DSC resource named Windows feature, which is one of the few built-in resources. I have named it backup. You can name it whatever you want. That name is really only used in one situation, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, each setting takes a number of values. What they take depends on what they do, and I'll show you how you can discover that information. This one has an ensure property, which I'm setting to present, and it has a name. So this is going to ensure that the Windows Server Backup feature is installed. Blah. Not that complicated. Here's something neat you can do. Logic. See? Now when I run this, if I specify the needs backup switch, that setting will get included in the moth. You see how you can start to break these down for different types of servers and different types of features? You know, if you've got a file server, dash file server, okay, that means these 15 settings have to happen. So you can get kind of complex with these if you want to. You can also do this. This is why you give your settings a name. It will not execute the file resource named web content until the Windows feature resource named backup has already happened. You can create dependencies. For example, don't try to join the domain until I've gotten your DNS server address set, because you won't find it. If you can get these things nicely stacked, and DSC knows how to unwind all of the dependencies that you set up so that it runs things in the right order. Cool, right? So when I run this, it's going to produce a moth file named nomatter.moth. It's going to automatically put it in a folder called server type A because that's the name of my config. It'll create a folder called server type A. It'll create nomatter.moth. And we'll talk about what the rest of that garbage is there for in a sec. Make sense so far? Any resource you can make or lay hands on can be used in these. There's also a trick where you can take a complete configuration script. So you can have the script, and it has the configuration block, and it has nothing else in it. it. It doesn't have any of this garbage afterwards that I have. You can save that as a DSC resource, and then include it in another config, which becomes called a composite configuration. So you might have a configuration that's like the stuff that applies to every one of your servers. Then another one that this goes to all our SQL servers, and then this goes to all our file servers. Then when you build the actual config, it just grabs those in. So you make little subunits. That's another way of modularizing these. We're not sure which strategy is going to work out best right now, because it's all kind of new. But it seems right now like composites are a nice way to go, but there's a couple of bugs with them. Um, they don't support depends on. So when I pull this into another one, it's going to run and it can't depend on anything else. That's a bug. It's been logged. I guess it'll get fixed. 
Another way to modularize is to use if blocks. Now on the one hand, if you use composites, you wind up with a lot of different configs that potentially have to be maintained. If you use one monolithic one with a bunch of if blocks, well, it's a big, giant script that has to be maintained. Honestly, it's probably more of a programming preference. Uh, if I've got a bunch of people working on these and I can break it down in a way that each person can have their own area of responsibility, that might be nice just from a process perspective. If I'm the one maintaining the whole thing, I don't know, maybe I just want it in a giant file like this. That's probably personal preference right now until we get some more experience with this. How this works. So I've got the moth file. I gotta get it to the computer, right? So I'll open up another one and I'm gonna show you, uh, we'll actually run this one. This is another config. This is creating a pull server. So there's two ways I can get a moth to a computer. The first way is push, that's the default. Meaning when, once you install WMF 4.0, the computer is not immediately going to go looking for configs on the network someplace, there's no way to do that. It's just gonna sit there and passively wait for someone to tell it what to do. So in push mode, here's my config. I run my config, which is this, and then I run start DSC configuration, give it the path to the configs, Minus weight makes it run interactively, which is great for debugging. You could also chuck on a minus verbose. That's nice too for debugging. This is going to run interactively. If you don't use minus weight, it runs this whole thing as a background job. This requires remoting. Remember that remoting is on by default in server 2012 and later for server OSs. So it's going to take that moth, open up a remoting connection to every computer that has a moth in that folder you could give it a computer name parameter to limit it down if you wanted, but by default, it'll find every moth file. Because the computer name is the file name, it knows what moth goes to what computer, and it is going to jam that thing over to that computer and make it run it. That's push. In push, you send out a new moth whenever you want to, and the computer, by default, reevaluates it every 15 minutes. Meaning, if someone goes in and undoes something, 15 minutes later it'll get put back. So this is designed to heal the configuration. You can configure it to simply monitor and produce log messages. You can configure it to apply once and then not enforce it. You got options. We'll look at some. So let's take a look at the default config. Um, let's get over to that machine. Oops. Is it lab? Ugh. Did I start the virtual machine? I wonder what I named it. Let's see. Control alt delete. It is company. Oh, I know what it is. I bet the IP addresses are wrong. Ten, everybody remember 10001. Got it? Um, you know how you build the perfect base image and then you realize you screwed something up? I would like everyone to notice the fact that I knew how to get here. Did anyone go to Tech Ed last year? Did you go to that session Jeffrey Snover and I did? No, maybe it wasn't last year. No, it was last year. We did a session together. Did you go to that? Can't believe you missed that. It was awesome. He, we decided we would present on my Mac. Bad idea. Um, he's like, where's the end key? We don't have one. How sad for you. <laughs> really, Jeffrey, in front of everyone? Well, then he goes to do something, and he pushes this key and he's like, oh no, that's not the alt key. And he lets go and I'm like, I don't know how to get back now. I'm lost. Uh, it's on channel nine. You should go look at it. <laughs> oh yeah, it's forever. And then I broke his mouse because we did it again. And we did it later. I'm like, no, no, we'll use your laptop this time. I'm, I'm done. Uh, and he's got one of those arc 
mice, and I'm trying to tap the left button, and it's not doing it. And I'm like tapping, and then I'm pushing. There's no clicky. I'm like, I can't get it. He's like, well, just push it. So I, I've been going to the gym, and the whole thing goes crack. I'm like, I broke Jeffrey Snover's mouse. Everyone laughs at me. 10 0 0 1, is that what we were convinced? All right. I suppose I should put this on the same subnet, right? Come on, Dover. Well, you wouldn't think reconfiguring the NIC would be that difficult. There we go. What's your, uh, curious, show of hands, who's, uh, who's running Windows 7 as like their main kind of baseline client OS? Anybody doing Windows 8? Good for you. A little's fine. You know, I'll tell you something. Nobody likes to hear this, but you're going to have to get used to working in an environment where you've got a little bit of everything. Because it's kind of always been that way anyway. Did, did y'all give up on the heterogeneous idea? It's not happening. Homogenous, all this, yeah, homogenous. Uh, enter PS session DC company dot PRI. I give up. Can you ping the DC. No, we can't. Here's why. All right, give that a second to adjust. Where were we? Oh, we were in the ISC. And we were going to make this work. Next time, everybody should bring their own virtual machines. There we go. Enter PS session. Yeah, so... Um, Real quick, get DSC local configuration manager. We'll show you how the LCM is set on this computer. Uh, you'll note that it is in push mode. It's going to refresh every 15 minutes. That's the minimum. You can set that to a lower number all you want to, and it won't stick. Um, it is set to apply and monitor, which means apply, apply, apply. Keep an eye on it. Keep applying it. So that's its default. Um, yeah, something that uh, we've got to separate in our heads here is the underlying technology, DSC, and the tools that allow us to manage this. There are none. What we have is the underlying technology. I suspect System Center will be that. So in, in, take a puppet world. What we have is the puppet agent and a bunch of puppet modules and not the puppet console. So the business where you assign computers to a role and that's how it figures out what config items to send them, yeah, we don't have that yet. No tooling around this at all. But early days, and now Microsoft releases new product every 15 minutes. So soon, someday. Uh, no tooling right now. All right, so that's that DC. That's how he's configured. Let's come back over here into the ISE, which wants to be my friend. Here we go. I'm going to tell that computer to become a pull server because the other way beyond push is pull. Now in pull mode, a little, little awkward, you have to start pull mode with a push. You push a config to a computer to reprogram its LCM to switch it to pull mode. You could also just walk your ass over to the computer and type a command, but anybody work for a university? Perfect. Interns. <laughs> Perfect solution. All your automation problems. Intern net. Um, in pull mode, you notice we had a, another configuration setting over there, another duration. This one means every 30 minutes, this computer is going to go to a special web server or file server, web server's better, and look and see if there's a new moth. And if there is, it'll suck it down. It will look at the moth to see what resources it relies on 
And if any of those aren't on the local computer, it will go back to the web server, or file server, web server is better, and it will download the zipped script modules, install them in its program files folder, and then start running them off. Do you see the beauty of the scheme? I'm gonna, who thinks this feels a little like GPO? A little bit, right? Every, every 30 minutes, that's the smallest you can set it, by the way, and those two values have to be multiples of each other. So if you, if you up the bottom one to 30, then you have to up the top one to 60. That's how it works. Uh, so every 30 minutes, I'm gonna go to my web server and I'm gonna see if you've put a new moth there for me. And if you have, I'm gonna grab it. And then I'm gonna say, do I have all the resources this needs? No, I don't. I'm just gonna go pull them. Oh, and there's a, you want version two of this resource. I've got version one. I'll get version two also and I'll unzip them for you. And this is both magical and extremely low tech and that's why I like it. This was clearly designed by a guy who's from Unix because it's just all the right zip file being in the right folder that makes it all work. So I'm gonna pull that down and then I'm gonna run it. So now I've got a whole distribution system. Here's why it's better than group policy for servers because this is a huge thing. When do I use this? When do I use group policy? One. No dependency on Active Directory, none. Group policy does. Anybody have servers that aren't in the domain? Of course you do. This works good because it doesn't need them to be in the domain. Two, the communications are by HTTPS, whichever. And we'll talk about which, which one's better and why. So easy to get through a firewall, right? Not like SMB, which can sometimes be a little eh, which is what group policy needs. Two, extensible. Group policy is pretty much about the registry. This is pretty much about everything you've got a resource for and it knows how to go get the resources and they don't have to be installed, they just have to be file copied to the right spot. Servers are good with this model because when we build a server, we pretty much want it to stay that way forever, right? It's not so much about change control, it's about stopping change on the server. Once it's set up and it's working, don't touch it. Servers don't move. I mean, they might float from VM host to host or whatever else, but it's not like your server's gonna suddenly find itself in Poughkeepsie. It's server. We lock them in a room by themselves and we don't let people near them. It doesn't change. Client computers, on the other hand, change constantly. Bastards roam all over the building. They wanna be on different printers. Stuff changes. They're, 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 the person who owns its role within the company changes. Now they're in sales, now they're in marketing, now they're the executive chief, because that's how it goes. So group policy works well for that. It's much more dynamic. You can assign multiple group policies to a single machine. So clients group policy, servers DSC right now. And what about for like a, a lab environment where you have a bunch of... Lab environment's a little bit different situation because they're not a personal computer at that point. Um, probably DSC. Assuming you can make DSC do everything you want it to do. Uh, because you also tear away that dependency on Active Directory. You know, I, in a lot of organizations, I need to set up my lab. I can't use GPO because I'm not allowed to touch the GPO stuff because that's the Active Directory guy. Well, you don't need him. You can do this. So we are going to, stick with me here, we're going to create them off. We're going to push it to a server and turn that server into a pull server from which other nodes can now pull their MOFs. So you use DSC to set up DSC. Why not? Here's what we're setting up. First, we're installing the DSC service. This is part of Windows Management Framework 4. You can't do this to a server that's not running Windows Management Framework 4. We're all clear that everything has to be PowerShell 4 now. Okay. What if you've got a machine running Exchange 2010, you can't install PowerShell 4 on that server. How do you get it to participate, upgrade to a newer version of Exchange that will support the PowerShell 4? This won't work without PowerShell 4. You're never going to make it happen. Um, or just switch to Office 365, which is what they want you to do anyway. Anybody on Exchange 2013? How's that working out? Did you migrate to that? Yeah? So you had to wait for the bits to come out to actually let you migrate.
because they didn't ship the migration bits with it the first time. I'm not sure the Exchange team was aware that that was going to be shipped to customers. They seemed a little surprised. Um, they really want you to switch to O365. You just prepare yourself for that. If you're thinking, well, we're thinking, you know, Exchange 2016 or 2018, that probably won't happen. Probably won't be any such thing. Anyway, next thing we're doing, we're installing the DSC service. I'm, in, I'm then have, see at the very top there, import DSC resource. Any resource you want to refer to that isn't in System 32, you have to explicitly import. That's what that line does. Because I plan to use the XDSC, XPS desired configuration. That has two resources, one of which is XDSC web service. I'm installing two web services. Let's talk about the first one. The first one is the actual pull server. I want to make sure it's present. I'm calling it DSC pull server. I'm putting it on port 8080. I'm giving it the path where I want the web files to go, a path where I want DSC modules to live in their zip files, a path where my configuration MOFs will live, and it depends on that DSC service feature being installed. I am configuring this for HTTP. That's why my certificate thumbprint is allow unencrypted traffic. This is a little misleading in its value. If you provide the thumbprint of an SSL cert, it'll use HTTPS. HTTPS uses what? SSL. Why do we like SSL? It is not encryption. I know that implies it's encryption and that's what everyone thinks. We don't give a crap about encryption. Because for one, if we're putting credentials in our MOFs, we have the ability to encrypt just the credential. We care about SSL because it is mutual authentication. Think about this for just a second before you go home and set up a pull server. I am telling a server, important machine, right? Telling a server, go over to this website and do whatever the hell it tells you. What if somebody spoofs that website? What if somebody can manage to spoof an IP address, which is not terribly complicated, right? You know how easy it is to spoof an IP address? All you have to do is wait until this machine tries to ARP that, I, that so it's gonna resolve the, the URL to an IP address and it's gonna have to ARP that IP address and that's gonna give it a MAC address and that's how it communicates. It's stupid stupid easy to spoof that process. All I have to do is respond to the ARP faster than that server does. And it's my MAC address that goes out and now I'm gonna get the traffic. And it doesn't matter about the IP address at that point. I'll be able to send whatever nasty config back to that server I want to unless we've set up SSL. Because with SSL, I as the pulling node am only going to talk to you if you present an SSL certificate that I trust. So if you can manage your trust list, you can make sure no one can spoof you because no one else will be able to get a certificate from your CA, right? That's why we like SSL. It's not about the encryption, it's about the mutual authentication. Before you set this up, I want you to be fully aware of how easy it would be to screw with you. Now look, we've never been hit. Yeah, Target said that. So did Neiman Marcus, so did Equifax, so did Michaels, so is everybody freaking else. You're gonna get hit. This is easy stuff for the script kitties to get you with. Once they've got your DSC pull server taken over, or they can spoof a pull server because you didn't require SSL, what can I tell all your servers to do? Any damn thing I want. Because this all runs as local system. I can write resources, I can push them off, I can make the machine pull that resource, and it has godlike powers on the local system. So, SSL, yes, okay. The second thing I'm setting up is a compliant server. Nobody knows what this does. Um, we know that it's not going to remain named compliant server. We know that there is a Windows internal database, and we know that after a client pulls its MOF and it runs its config, it reports back and says, I am conformant to my config or I am non-conforming. That's it, true, false. 
So you should be able to qu query this thing and get a list of machines that are not conforming and then go do something about it. Um, nobody knows how that works. There's no tooling on top of this. No one will talk about it. I plan to corner some people this week and find out what the hell. Um, but right now they've told the MVPs, and keep in mind we're under non-disclosure, they've told us, uh, don't talk about that yet. Well, you know you shipped it in the product, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. So I'm setting these two things up. You wanna do it? Sure, let's do it. Here we go. There's the moth. There goes the, D, uh, the start DSC configuration. It is currently testing to see if I am configured the way I'm supposed to be. I'm not. So now it's configuring me the way I'm supposed to be. It's going to take it a second because, you know, when you do server manager, you get all the dependencies. Well, this DSC service is a really deeply nested. It has to install all of IIS. It's doing it right now. If you've ever tried to write a script that does all this, you know how much work is happening. But it was no work at all for me. There was no programming for me. I didn't code anything. These configuration scripts are relatively plainish English. Here's how your configuration management goes in the future. Make sure the LCM is configured to pull and apply and monitor. The auditor checks that. And then this is what I've sent him. Well, we need to make sure it's configured that. No, you don't. DSC's turned on. That's the config. Therefore, that's what's in place. Have a nice day. That's it. It's really a change. You ever have a server that breaks, broke? Anyone ever? <laughs> What's the first thing you ask? What changed? A lot of folks will start going down this, this weird place with DSC. And what until uh, I, was, I was, I think I was teaching a class. I forget where this was. Maybe it was North Carolina. I've been so many places. We, we really had to talk about this. I didn't, I didn't realize that that is where our heads go. How, many of you, how long have you been in IT? Give me a number. 27 years. 27 years. Dude, retire. <laughs> <laughs> too long. God, I'm probably real close to that too. That's depressing now. Okay. We, our, our brains are wired to ask what changed. Hey, uh, this isn't what changed. We're, we're like OCD about it. It's the first words out of our mouth. And so folks will go down this path of DSC, but I want to send them off to the computer, and then I want it to report back and tell me what's wrong, what is conforming, and which bits aren't. Because that way I can have a model of what the server's supposed to look like, and it can tell me the differences. There aren't any. The point of the technology is, what changed? Nothing. Nothing changed. Nothing can change, because the server would have fixed it 15 minutes later. That's the point of it. If problems are caused by changes, this turns them off. So long as this is on and running, which is an easy check, there's actually bits in the WMI repository you can query to find out when it last ran and if it was conformant or not. What, are you conformant? Yes. Well, there you go, nothing changed. Must be something else. You really gotta change your thinking because this means no more change. So let's. Yeah, this enforced thing, is it obviously enforced that I said this should have X installed, and if it's not, put it back? Will this, will this enforce if someone comes in and adds install something outside? Um, will this enforce taking things away? Yeah. If you can be explicit about it, yes. Meaning, ensure absent is also an option. But you've got to list everything you want to be absent. A better approach for what you're after, which is I want to make sure that there's no damn software running that I didn't know about, is called AppLocker. And I don't know why more people don't use it on their servers. I know clients are tough because uh, how many applications do you have running on your clients? <coughs> right? All of them. How many applications are there? We have them all. Servers aren't like that. 
Servers, it's a very defined list. And if you're not using AppLocker on your servers, it's because you're still thinking in the XP world and you haven't upgraded your brain yet. Because since Vista, we've had the ability to run a PowerShell command that says, tell me what's running on this machine right now. Now make that the only stuff that will run, period. And it'll do that. And then part of your change control process, we need to add something to this. Great. Part of that is going and updating this list, which is a nice enforcement point. So that's a better tech for that because it's ongoing. You don't have to install as much anti-malware on your servers if you know that these are the only processes that can physically run. So let me see if that's done. Uh, yeah, Windows Automatic Updating isn't installed. That's sad. So I just made a web server and created a pull server on it. So now, now we're going to talk about pull mode. I'm going to run this configuration. Now, look at this down to line 27. When I run this, what is going to appear on disk? I'm going to get a new moth named. It's going to be named nomatter.moth. I do not have a computer called nomatter. Here's why it's called that, though. In pull mode, when a computer goes to the web server, and incidentally, um, we're going to see this in a sec. I'll show you where you set it. You can set up pull mode just on a file share. If you do it with a file share, there's no compliance check-in. So if you, have a pull ser a, a, if you have a node pulling from a pull web server, it can check in with that compliance piece and say, I'm good or bad. If you have it pulling from an SMB file share, it can't do that. There's no check-in process. That's what you lose. Uh, so when I, as a node, go to my pull server, I'm going to be looking for a file name, not my computer name. I'm going to be looking for a file name that's a GUID, Globally Unique Identifier. And you have to tell me up front, when you switch me to pull mode, what GUID I'm supposed to pull. That way, multiple servers can pull the same moth. You 20 machines all need to look identical all the damn time. Therefore, you all pull this one moth. Yes, boss, they will. So at the bottom of this script, after nomatter.moth gets created, I'm creating a new GUID. And I'm simply copying my moth from nomatter.moth over to my pull server and I'm renaming it in the process to be gwid.moth, whatever that gwid was I just made up. You will notice that I'm saving that as a global variable in my shell console, because in this demo, I use it again in the next bit. Then, once the moth is actually on the pull server, you have to generate a checksum file for it. You guys know what a checksum is, right? The node uses that for two reasons. Uh, the first thing it uses that checksum for is to see if the moth has changed. Because the moth might be huge. So it might be a big effort for the machine to pull the moth every 30 minutes, only to find out, oh, that's exactly the same damn moth I had last time. I'll try again in 30 minutes. So instead, it just looks at the checksum. If the checksum is different, it pulls the moth. If the checksum doesn't change, it doesn't pull the moth. You got to remember that, new moth, new checksum. The checksum also lets it make sure that it downloaded the moth correctly. After it downloads the moth, it calculates the checksum and they have to match or it knows there was a problem in transmission. So we're going to run this. God, this is nerve wracking, especially since I made changes to it. OK, what the heck? What could go wrong? That, apparently. Um, Yada, yada, yada. Well, it produced the moth. Oh, you know why? It saved it in the wrong folder. Let's just do it again. Liar, liar, liar. Yeah, it's because once you give it an output path, it doesn't, uh, 
it won't automatically create the subfolder server type A. I know. There we go. So in theory, that should now be over on my DC. Let's go find it. And it should be in this path. CD, all that. Oh, right, quote. Yay, there it is, and there's its checksum. That's awesome, right? Now let's go make a computer actually pull that. So let's take a look at that. That's the next bit. Engage pull mode. You make another configuration. This one is special. It's targeting the computer. You can see the node. I'm passing in the GUID. So down on line 23 when I run this, I pass in that same global GUID variable. So that's how the GUID gets in here. But I don't have a resource. I'm not referring to a DSC resource because this configuration is reprogramming the LCM on that computer. It is switching it to pull mode. It is switching it to apply only. I actually don't like that. It ruins the demo later, but we'll change it to apply and monitor, which is, I think, what it's set to by default. Didn't we figure that out? Get DSC local. Yeah, apply and monitor. Um, I'm setting the refresh and the configuration to low values just to prove that it won't matter. It's not going to affect anything. Here's the GUID. Go to pull mode. And I want you to do that via the web download manager as opposed to the one that uses SMB file shares. And each download manager lets you specify, in this case, the URL and HTTP. With the SMB one, it would just be the UNC path of where to go. That's it. We run this. That produces a moth. That'll be called uh, dc.company.pri.moth. And then I run it, and I push that out, I hope. Waka wa. What do you mean you can't find weight? Oh, yeah, you can't on that one. That's always a quickie. There it is. Get DSC local configuration manager. Apply and monitor, pull. There it is. It's all changed. Um, that is happening. Right now, that's actually occurring. It is going to the web server. It is getting them off. It is pulling it down. It is evaluating it. It is running it. It is going to try and copy some file data and install uh, Windows Backup. We'll come back to it in about 15 minutes and see what it's done. While it's doing that, let's take a look at a resource. I want to look at a fairly simple one. Modules, PS desired state configuration, DSC resources. Let's look at the O oh, role. Uh, this is what a DSC resource looks like. It really boils down to three functions. Um, everything else is internal only, so these are private because you'll see at the end it's only exporting those three main functions, get, set, and test target resource. Test accepts a configuration hash table, ensure present, feature name, Windows Server, back, whatever, and it tells you yes or no. I am configured the way you said or not. Set takes a configuration resource and makes it happen. Get is supposed to return the current configuration. The system doesn't really do anything with that right now. But that way, you're meant to be able to look and see what the current config looks like. So to write one of these resources, you simply have to write those three functions. That's it. If you know how to check and see if whatever it is you need to configure is configured, and if you know how to configure it however you want it configured, you know how to write one of these. 
So if I get into the, the set on this one, for example, these are the things it takes. Looks present, present or absent for ensure, uh, source path, includes subfeatures, credential, log path. There's the name of the resource. That's the only one that's mandatory. Just a function. If you know how to write advanced functions, this is pretty easy. Um, and validating some prereqs. I mean, there's logic in here, but you know, at the end of the day, it's really just running add Windows feature, remove Windows feature. That's it. They're not terribly complex. They can get complicated, obviously, depending on how wacky it is you need to configure whatever you need to configure, but structurally, they're very simple. There is, in the DSC resource kit from Microsoft, a resource designer module, and it gives you a couple commands. And you use those commands to specify, okay, I want my resource to be named this, and I want it to have these different settings. And it will create the framework of this for you, and it will create the schema moth that has to go with it. Neat stuff? Questions? Tell you what, Question. it's not time yet. No, go ahead. So the, uh, the 15 and 30 minutes, the, the minimums that you can set for those, thinking of a server provisioning scenario, is, is there a way that I can trigger a method to yeah. do it now? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple ways you can do that. I think in the DSC book, we give you an example that, that uh, pokes the repository and kicks it off. There's a couple ways to do it. Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's a couple of settings in, on the LCM, too. Uh, and let's make sure we highlight those. Uh, let me just query the local. The local, local configuration manager, get DSC local. Um, see that? That's the default. It won't reboot when it needs to by default. You can change that, obviously. But you can let it do stuff, and then it won't. Now. You're not going to deploy patches with this. You might only want this to do things during that same maintenance window. This is not Windows Update. You have a solution to deploy patches. This is to maintain the ongoing configuration of the computer. Meaning, one of those might be make sure Windows Update is installed and is looking at this WSIS server and so forth. That's configuration. Actually going and getting the patches is WSS's job. Just make sure you're not forgetting all the other crap Windows already does. This is designed to make sure settings are set. This is not necessarily ongoing maintenance with some, there's, you can do a lot of neat stuff with this, don't get me wrong, but you, what you're not gonna do is have a moth that lists all the patches you want installed because after Windows has been released for 10 days, that list is too big. So that's what WSS does. But you would use this to make sure WSS was turned on. Can you make sure that it's, if this only runs within a certain time frame, is it like, I don't want it to do the checking in? It's basically a scheduled task. Okay. Mm -hmm. You could fuss with it, yeah. Now look, don't get thrown off by the fact that there is a feature I showed you called compliance. The reason they're changing the name on that is because we all have a word in our head and we have a concept that goes with that word. This ain't it. 15 minutes is your maximum granularity. If you've got a legal reason to make sure a computer is always, always configured a certain way, this ain't it. Then again, neither is Puppet or Chef or any of those. You've got other things that are gonna have to come into play there. Can an administrator shut this off? Yes. How can we stop him? You can fire him. <laughs> but if he's a freaking administrator, the point of his job is to be able to shut stuff like this off. So, you know, there's a difference between, well, our company doesn't like to fire people. You have a stupid company. We can't fix that. So understand what this is meant to do and what it's not meant to do. Because I've had these discussions where people want to go down this rabbit hole of how do I make this absolutely in You can't. Stop. Just stop it. Turn off the computers, go home. They'll be safe that way. 
Just understand that. Let's take a 15 minute breaky break. Uh, it's 10 o'clock, let's come back at 10.15 and I can start a new recording. <coughs> new topic. Any last follow-up questions on DSC? And we'll, we'll circle back around at the end and make sure, because this is one you have to percolate with a little while. Read the DSC book. That gets the base technology in your head. It's got a lot of examples. A lot of these ones I actually showed you are, are in that book as well. And if the next question is, what's the best way? We don't know yet. Naming of what? Yeah, so the naming, um, we don't know yet. Okay. We know that on the resources, uh, Microsoft owns resources that start with MSFT. So don't run out and start writing your own custom resources that start with MSFT. Um, they've asked, so the DSC resource kit resources, which are web released, have an X for experimental meaning no support. But once they feel those are ready to roll into a product ship, they'll probably be renamed MSFT, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, Jeff talked about that. Yeah. They've asked that uh, people that steal those and sort of repurpose those change the X to a C for community, which we've done. Um, in terms of your own, probably the standard practice of coming up with a short prefix that identifies your company which you should be doing with your functions as well, right? It shouldn't be get OS info, it should be get Contoso OS info. You should probably do that with your DSC resources. Now, the config names, the only place that becomes a, a marker in the world is that's the folder name the MOF files go into. So probably something descriptive would be best. Um, the setting names, you know, Windows feature backup. That only is used as a dependency reference within the script. So that doesn't have to be scoped very tightly because it already is scoped tightly. You probably don't need to namespace that. Um, MOF names are either going to be the computer name or GWT. That's a fixed point in time. Um, that's probably it. The, the resources is the thing everybody's a little panicky about because it's, it's the whole PowerShell lack of actual namespacing worry. So you have to fake out a namespace with a prefix. The DSC book on PowerShell.org? PowerShell.org, go to the resources menu, go to ebooks. All of our freaking ebooks are there. Okay. And they're all free. They're all on a OneDrive account. Um, there is a possibility that we will introduce a second tier of ebooks. And the DSC book is probably a candidate to be moved into that. And that will probably be a $20 a year subscription. And that will let us kick a couple bucks to the authors um, and a couple bucks to help run PowerShell.org. So that one in particular, because that's going to wind up being a full 200 page book at some point in its life, um, it's e easier to make that happen if the author can take his family out to dinner, <coughs> pay the mortgage. Because um, I have a co-author on that, obviously, too. So understand that that may happen with some of those ebooks at some point, but right now it's up there for free. Uh, and we are really important with those ebooks. Um, you have to go back and check them. You have to go get the new one, like, monthly. Because we, we just go in and update them on a whim. So there's always new material in there. That tier two, would that be for any ebook that's in that tier? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I mainly envision that being the, the bigger, more fully fleshed out bookie book books. Because um, I'm freaking done with publishers. I really, really am. Manning's a great publisher. And by the way, I need to point out, because if you're not familiar with Manning's process, if you look in the front cover of your in-depth book, there's a voucher. That will get you a free PDF, EPUB, and Moby Pocket version of that book. All Manning books do that, no matter where you buy them. Uh, which is why I like them, and they're a good publisher, but done with publishers. Microsoft Press really annoyed me, so I'm just, I'm over it now. Other DSC questions? Okay. We'll loop back around. If you, if you think of any, jot it down. We'll come back to it. 
Um, I think the next thing I want to talk about is, is tracing the command line in Windows PowerShell. Because this is, how many of you have ever used trace command? How many have never used trace command? OK, just making sure you're paying attention. Um, I had a class one time. This was in DC. Anyone from DC area? So you know how they get. Um, I had two classes with, with these folks. I, I had like a, a five day and a three day. And they told me, now the three day is a lot of our more our junior admins and stuff. I'm like, OK, well, three days is, is perfect to do an introductory PowerShell course for junior admins. So I, the phrase I used to use when I, I, I would I do these beginner classes, just kind of set everybody, because folks get a little nervy about it sometimes. You know, it looks like a programming language. That's not what they signed up for. I said, look, this is easy. How many of you have ever run ping? Nobody raises their hands. <laughs> well, but see, I'm, I'm thinking this is one of these groups that I'm going to have to kill myself to get anything out of them, right? Like the Belgians, you talk to the Belgians and they just sit there and stare at you and you're like, oh my god, I'm dying up here. Um, so I, I said, no, seriously, how many of you have never run ping? And they're all just kind of, ah. Okay, how many of you have never run ping? Every hand goes up. Oh, shit. Oh. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And I'm going to completely change what we were going to be doing because I was not prepared for that. This is a keyboard. <laughs> this is a mouse. You will not need that. Put it over there. Uh, OK, so we're going to, the, the, the first bit of this tracing commands may be a little bit remedial. Um, you might know some of this. I'm going to kind of go through it quickly. If it doesn't make sense, you have to stop me and say, do it again slower. I'm good with that. But um, if you're thinking that I'm going too fast, you don't understand it, you need to understand that you're probably not the only one. One of you is going to have to be brave enough to be the grown up who said, I need you to go slower. Because otherwise I won't. I'll just talk faster and faster and faster the more caffeine I get. But here's where we're going to start with this. Uh, we're going to start with why, why this works. What will that do? <laughs> not as bad as you think. It'll actually kill PowerShell.exe pretty quickly and probably not crash my computer. Uh, but let's think about what pow how PowerShell executes this. A lot of people look at this and they see, okay, get process is going to get all the processes and then a miracle occurs and stop process will stop them all. We got to think really hard about how the data gets from one to the other. And if you came from DOS, you've probably done dir pipe more. Unix guys do piping all the time. This is nothing like that. PowerShell doesn't have standard in, it doesn't have standard out, it doesn't have standard error. PowerShell doesn't deal with text. A PowerShell command can only take its input, and this is a dramatic, prophetic statement. And if you can remember this in your head, you'll never go wrong. PowerShell commands only take input via parameters. That's it. So when I don't have any parameters typed, and when there's a crack in the pipeline, PowerShell has to pick that stuff up out of the pipeline and attach it to a parameter of some kind, invisibly, under the hood. So we're going to look at the theory behind how this works, and then we're going to use trace command to actually get it to show us. So the first thing it needs to do is figure out what type of object this is. Get member tells us that. This is a process. You, know, you can usually just take the last hunk of this type name and just remember that. It's just a process. So we look then at the help forget service. Sorry. What command are we doing? Stop process. I'm not going to type anymore today. Somebody get me a mouse. Do you see any parameters that can take input of the type process? Yes. Who sees it? Who sees it? OK. Input object, yeah? But we got to make sure it can take it from the pipeline, because not all commands do. And this does take it from the pipeline, and it takes it by value. I hate that description. I wish it said by type name. It'd be a lot easier to teach this stuff to the newcomers. But that's what it's called. PowerShell always does by value first. Always, always, always. And it not only does by value first, it tries really hard to do by value. It will try and convert stuff so that it can do by value. By value apparently feels better. And it likes it. So you've got to remember how hard it will try to do by value. So that's why this works. 
I've got a bunch of processes. The next command appears to have a parameter that will take those from the pipeline by value. So I'm going to dump all those processes onto that parameter and then let her rip. Good? What will that do? Yep. Well, we're going to find out. This produces a service controller. Agreed? Up arrow. Do you see any parameters that accept a service controller? Input object does not accept a service controller. It accepts a process. Plan B, well, plan A and a half, are there any parameters that accept a generic object? We call that the, the type O blood of the .NET framework world. Does anything in here just take object? No. All right, well, then we're done. Now we actually go to plan B, which is called by property name. So now we need to look at the parameters of this second command that are actually rigged for this. Does minus force accept pipeline input? Nope. Does minus ID accept pipeline input? Yes, by property name. So remember ID. Input object, does it accept pipeline input by property name? No. It does it by value. We're done with that. It let us down. We're divorced. We've moved on. Minus name? Yes. No, nothing else does. So minus name and minus ID are our candidate parameters. We need to go back and at the object that's in the pipeline again. Does this have a name property? Does it have an ID property? No. Therefore, because it has a property spelled N-A-M-E and there is a parameter spelled N-A-M-E, they hook. It's so not magical. That's it. So the service names the service names are going to attach to the name parameter of stop process. Who thinks this will work? It'll do something. Because service names are usually not the same as their executable name, which is what the process name would be. Now you run this on a server running DNS. The service name is DNS and the process name is DNS. That would stop it. So kinda it works. Understanding that that's how PowerShell wants to play the game is massively important. For example, um, This is version four. Ah, eh, what the heck. We'll do this one. The problem is I have all these great examples about how it's screwy and then every version they fix them. <laughs> and the class actually gets hard to teach. Uh, okay, let's look at this one. Does minus computer name accept pipeline input? How? Plan B, right? Let's see what else we got. Um, dependent services, no. Display name, no. Exclude, no. Include, no. Input object does, by value. That's a service controller. Name, oh, name does. Name does it both ways. Name's flexible like that. Name's like a lounge lizard. It'll take the input anyway it can get it. It'll take it by value. What does it take by value? What data type? A string. So if I pipe in a string, it's going to get hooked up to this. Yeah? Make sense? But it will also take it by property name. Got a couple ways. Let's play with this. What's the first line in a CSV file usually? Header. Header. 
So I have three objects, each of which has a computer name property, right? So I don't know why I did that. What will that do? Give it to confidence, man. Say it. It's going to go get the services. We know that because it says get service on all those computers. It will, in fact, do no such thing. It is busy breaking, even as we speak. See? Why? Why, why, why? Well, I refuse to guess. Here's the thing I think you have to be a little bit careful about. And this, this is troubleshooting now. And the worst way to troubleshoot is to guess. Troubleshooting is a science. You can voice a theory only if you can prove or disprove that theory. Trace command is how you prove and disprove the theory. More importantly, with trace command, if you're using it right, you don't need a theory. You don't have to guess what PowerShell is doing and then prove it or disprove it. You can just ask PowerShell, what the hell are you doing? So it's a little bit to read, but let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Um, That's a lot. Let's just go straight to parameter binding. This exact syntax is in the help. It's the first example in trace command. This is the command I want to trace. The command runs. This isn't some magical what if. So you're not going to do this with like del c dash recurs as fun time, right? It's going to run the command. It has to. I want the output at the host. And the only thing I want to see of all the millions of things it can trace is parameter binding, because that's what I'm trying to figure out. There's going to be a lot of spew. And we're going to look at it. Whoops. Come back. Error messages and all. OK. The first thing. And when I speak slowly like this, it's important. The first thing PowerShell always does is hook up named command line parameters, meaning when you typed minus blah, 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 that goes first. We didn't type any, though, did we? Well, we did on, we, no, we didn't do any named parameters. There's our command. Have you seen any named parameters? Nope. There's two commands. Neither has a named parameter. Next, bind positional parameters. Ah, we did have a positional parameter on import CSV, right? So it is binding the argument comps.csv to the parameter path. If you were ever confused about what that got hooked up to, now you know. It hooked it up to path. Named goes first, positional goes second. So uh, I'm binding this collection parameter path Path is of the argument type string, but the parameter wants a string array. Whenever a parameter is capable of accepting multiple values and array, PowerShell implicitly creates a single item array. If I say I want an array of strings, I'll only take an array of strings. You can't just give me one. I wanted a bunch. So PowerShell will create a bunch with one item, creating an array with element type system.string and one element. The argument type of string, I'm treating it as scalar, I'm adding it to the array. Now we're going to execute some validation data, and I bound it to the parameter path successfully. Yay. Let's check our mandatory parameters. Nothing failed, so we got everything. Next command. I haven't run anything yet. We're pre-scanning the command line to figure out what's going on. Bind named parameters, none. Positional, there were none. 
did we provide all the mandatory parameters? Yep. Now, begin processing both commandlets. Both commands run simultaneously. Both commands are running at this point. I've got a pipeline object. I need to bind it to get service. The pipeline object is of the type PS custom object. I'm binding it to the name parameter because I've managed to, I want so badly to do this by value that I've just turned this PS custom object into a string. And I can hook a string up to dot dash name. It was not hooking it up to the computer name parameter. It was hooking it up to the name parameter and I can see it doing it right there. It was looking for a service called at curly bracket computer name equals DC curly bracket because it passed it to the name parameter. Everybody see it doing it? You don't need to know why. Don't get too hung up on, well, why'd they do it that way? It really doesn't matter. You can ask them Tuesday night. But it doesn't matter because that's what it does. You have to get a very pragmatic attitude about PowerShell sometimes. If you get hung up on, why does it do it that way, you'll go nuts. It just does. Suck it up. Manipulate it. What happens first? What parameter binding goes first? Named parameters. When you attach a value to a named parameter, that's off the table for future use. PowerShell cannot take anything out of the pipeline and hook it up to minus name now. I specified minus name. It's going to have to try something else. And that something else will work. Because I took minus name off the table. Let's trace that one. Wee. There's my named command line for import CSV. That's going to do the same thing. And bar de bar 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 bar. We are doing named command line arguments for get service, binding star to name. There were no positionals. We passed the mandatory call begin processing. I got a pipeline object. I got to bind it to get service. It's a PS custom object. I'm binding computer name, pipeline input, value from pipeline by property name, DC to the parameter computer name. Fixed it because I took the other thing off the table. Forced it to go with plan B because I made plan A impossible. neat trick, right? I will see people, and this devastates me because it, it makes them hate PowerShell. I will see people screw around with this type of approach all the time. And it's partially the fault of people like me running around, yay, pipeline, go pipeline. You want to make everything into a one-liner in the pipeline. Well, you know what? Sometimes if it's not doing it, would you rather be right or would you rather be done? And you have to ask yourself that question. If you're the type of person who will bang your head into a brick wall until the brick wall gives way, you're going to spend a lot of time and bleed a lot. If you just want to get stuff done, take the pipeline off the table, man. Go get those three objects out of that CSV, extract the contents of the computer name column so that it's just a string, and feed it to that. There's no pipeline parameter binding here anymore. There's no pipe. 
I'm not piping something to get service. Well, a lot of times, a parenthetical can solve the problem. But I really want to do it the PowerShell. Shut up. There's no PowerShell way. There's the way that gets it done. So sometimes if you're getting into one of those situations and you're tracing it and you're like, I just don't understand why it's doing it, well then stop doing it. Doc, it, it hurts when you quit it. Just don't. Just be aware you've got other options. Just figure out what PowerShell is doing and make that not an option anymore. But trace command is an incredibly valuable tool for figuring out what it's doing as you troubleshoot things. Questions? How do you know when you have two parameters by value which one is going to change? You cannot have two parameters of the same data type be by value. The command won't compile. It's illegal. Because then PowerShell would be like, uh, and it has no criteria for deciding. If a command was ever written that way, and you fed it, and PowerShell tried to make that decision, it would bomb with an error message. I don't know how to resolve this. It will, it, it will almost never just do something. It will usually explode. So, so why, did, why did the service do that command in the first place? Because it really likes to do by value. Minus name can take a string, and it was able to take the pipeline input and make it look like a string. Because at the end of the day, you can make almost any damn thing look like a string. And PS custom objects in particular are very flexible. But they kind of look like a hash table under the hood, and that makes it feel that it's a string. I'll, I'll show you one. I'll show you one they really borked up, and I'll show you what they did to fix it. This booger, invoke command, you guys seen this, right? Look at the help for this in version 3 or version 2. Actually, it might just be version 2. I forget when they fixed this. Uh, in the help, it would tell you that minus computer name accepted pipeline input by property name, meaning if you can pipe in an object that has a computer name property, it will target those. I thought, this is gorgeous. Never, ever could get it to work because, uh, and if you look at computer name now, see it right there? Does not accept pipeline input. They had coded the command to do it, but this is where you can get a little tied up in yourself. Minus input object accepts pipeline by value. That always happens first. By value first, by property name second. Plan A, plan B. What type of data does input object want? Anything. Typo. If you've got a command that accepts object by value, that will always get all the pipeline input forever for always done. You will never drop down to plan B and do by property name. So the way they fix this is they just change the documentation to reflect that it actually won't work. <laughs> I'll show you another one because you've got to be careful. Got to be careful. Get hotfix. Anybody ever play with this dude? Uh, but a bit of a computer name. Does the computer name parameter accept pipeline input? <laughs> you would be appalled how often that comes up in help files. We've coded the commandlet to do this, sort of but not really. So people will fight this for days. It says it takes pipeline input. Yeah, but it also says it doesn't. So why did it die? I don't do why. I don't know why. Go to connect. Do you guys know where to log bugs? Connect.microsoft.com? You log in with your Microsoft.net Hotmail Live Passport ID? Bug it. Bug it so that they at least decide which one. Trace command questions?
there's actually a bunch of stuff you can trace. It's really, really beneficial to, to dig into that command and, and see the really rich information it can return on what's happening as each command actually runs through its complete life cycle. Gives you a lot of insight about how PowerShell works. Okay. I think next I want to talk about functions because we got to get into these so we can talk about some of the other stuff. So let's just make a function. I have a, 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 a programming thing that I've always kind of followed. There, there's two schools around this. One type of folk will often start with something very, very simplistic and then add to it and add to it and add to it and build it up into something. And that's fine. But to a point, I like to start as I mean to end, which means I never write basic simple functions. I always write advanced functions. I always start, well, how many of you use the ISE at all? Control J, advanced function. You knew about that, right? Yay, worth the price of admission. <laughs> that would be a snippet. Um, it is in the menu. It is Control-J to start it. You can add your own snippets. That saves a bunch of time. Um, I don't always do this because I'm not crazy about the formatting, but whatevs. We're just going to start simple. So I always start with commandlet binding and a parameter block. And I want you to notice something about the way I type. Anytime I type an opening construct, parenthesis, curly bracket, I immediately type the end and put a space between the two. Always, 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 always. Because then I will never forget. Never, 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 never. Um, I always do commandlet binding because commandlet binding turns on all of the common parameters. My function now supports error action, error variable, minus verbose, minus debug. All those things have just been magically handed to me on a silver tray because I typed that. Therefore, I always type that because I like free stuff. So I would never write a function that lacks that. I will then nearly always go put in the hunk where my comment-based help will live. Because people who write comment-based help go to heaven, and people who don't go to hell. And if you're writing your comment-based help, that's where to put it. There are three legal places to put it. There is only one morally just place to put it. <laughs> Legally, it can appear before the function. The problem is, when you collapse the function, the help doesn't go with it. The problem is, if you put help above your first function and you don't have exactly the right number of blank lines, PowerShell will take it as help for the module, not for the function. You can also put it at the end of the function before the closing curly bracket, but that's just dumb. So this is the good place to put it. It keeps the function self-contained. If some idiot comes along and copies and pastes this whole thing, they're going to get the help too. So that's the right place to put it. Um, I will nearly always assume that this is going to accept pipeline input of some kind, and so I'll go ahead and put in my three named script blocks that need to be present in a pipeline input style of function. And then I'll start putting my parameters in place. I will always have, I will always use mandatory instead of creating my own prompt. Because I don't always know the context in which this script is going to run. If it's running in a console, my read host prompt would be fine. If it's running somewhere else, like in operations manager, it doesn't implement read host. I'll get an error. So I always let the shell do what the shell can do. If there's a way to have PowerShell do it for me, that's the way I'm going to do it because it's consistent that way. If I run this and I don't specify, a, a, sorry, I should give it a name too, right? 
If I don't specify mine as computer name, I'll be prompted for it the same way every other command prompts for mandatory parameters. My goal is consistency. Why did I choose the parameter name minus computer name? Who said that? You get a lunch bag. Consistency. There's a lot of effort in learning PowerShell. Don't make someone learn more. PowerShell commands all use minus computer name. Therefore, you use minus computer name. You want this to taste, feel, smell, touch everything like a real little boy, like a real commandlet. Consistency. Now, you may say to yourself, self, the thing is, I plan to pipe objects into here from Active Directory. And in Active Directory, the property I want to hook up to is CN, not computer name. So now I'm going to have to do all this munging in the pipeline. No, you don't. That'll pipeline bind as well. Now that can accept a property called CN or a property called computer name, and it'll all go to the same variable. And while we're at it, horizontal scrolling is bad. So I will often do this. Keeps it prettier, easier to read. Always keep, keep easy to read in mind. There's times when we're going to do harder to read to gain a performance advantage. There are times when we're going to do pretty because it's maintainable. Um, and let's be real clear about something. I get into huge arguments with other, other MVPs. It'll probably happen sometime this week. Lord knows, especially if I've been drinking. I think you should do things this way because it's maintainable and easy to read. And maintainable and easy to read is the hardest thing to conquer. Well, yeah, but that's low performance. If you're processing 60,000 objects, that takes two seconds longer. Shut up about two seconds. Right? That's like telling me, well, you know, if you park right up next to the building, it's 25 cents more than if you park three blocks away. Here's 10 bucks. I'll be here a while. Right? There's certain things I'm willing to pay for. The toughest part, and we talked about this on the break, the toughest part about PowerShell is not the performance, it's finding somebody who can read the damn stuff. The more you focus on easy to read, the longer that investment is likely to last. And let's be real honest with each other. If your goal is super high performance, you found the wrong tool. You should be probably coding in C++. Because this is always going to be a dynamic language running in the DLR on top of the CLR, on top of the .NET framework, on top of a bunch of com crap, on top of a bunch of API. There's 18 layers to the hardware. Never going to be high performance. So I tend to err on the side of easy to read. Now. Let me show you what not to do. This, this vexes me when people do this. So we're going, to, we're going to make you not do this. Everybody put on your electroshock therapy glove. Don't try to do too much in a single tool. There are two types of scripts in the PowerShell world. There is a tool and there is a controller. A tool does one thing, one small, tightly scoped thing. A tool is always a function, always a function. If it's not a function, it's not a tool. It is a function and it does one small thing because that is easy to debug. You can take it off by itself out behind the woodshed and beat it into shape and then bring it into production and you can, you can test it as a unit. A controller is single purpose. A tool is general purpose. How many of you know what a hammer is? What is a hammer used for? Nails. Hitting things. <laughs> nails. If it's a claw hammer, it's pulling nails. People's heads. Lug nuts. It's a tool. It has a use in many different processes. 
The hammer itself was not designed for any specific process. It's generic. It is designed as a tool to use when you need to hit things with other things. That's its function. A process, like a, a house blueprint, puts the tool to use. Separate those two. Meaning, you do not write tools that generate input and do work. I would never write a tool I would never, ever, ever, ever do this. Because I have now locked myself to CSV as a form of input. What about when this needs to pull computer names from somewhere else? Oh, I'll just reprogram it. Oh, you have that much free time? I want to work for your company. I never do that. Tools. So we've got tools and we've got controllers. There are three kinds of tools. Tools that create input for other tools to use, tools that do shit, and tools that do something with the output. And they don't mingle. All right, this is a stronger taboo than co-ed. These guys stay in separate dorms. You know, at, at the top, uh, creating input, get. Your verb tells you what type of tool you're writing, get import, convert from, output, format, out, export, convert to, right? I do not have a tool Lord God, people do this. Um, let's see. We'll just hammer something out. Yeah, I know. I know. This, this hurts to actually type. I hate that. That is not a tool. That is a controller. I am taking tools and I am tying them to a specific process. You don't build that. You've got too many things going on there. Instead, you do this. You know the sim commands will tab complete your class names for you? They just take a second to get going the first time. There it goes. Oops, we got to do a for each here, don't we? Hey, trivia question for you, because I told you the answer earlier. What type of data is computer name? Uh, who, what, 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 what doesn't start with us? Array. Array. Did you say that? You get a lunch bag. It's an array. It's always an array. Sometimes it only has one thing in it. But it's always an array. Even if it only has one thing, it's an array. You have to enumerate it with for each. Have to, every time. Because it's an array. You have to go through one at a time. Sometimes there might be two, sometimes there might be one. Doesn't matter. Have to enumerate. In a pipeline situation, I only get one object in the pipeline at a time. But it'll still be an array. Because PowerShell has to make it an array of one item every single time. So if I pipe in 10 computer names, I'm going to get one at a time, 10 arrays with one item. You have to enumerate them anyway. So let's do one more of these. Oh, stupid, stupid, stupid. Okay. Got two pieces of information here. What's the right way to create output that includes both? Build them into an object. Build them into an object. Never output text. Never output two different types of things to the pipeline. 
You wreck PowerShell's whole model of the universe when you do that. That won't work. I do wish I had an end key now and again. I did that as CS. I think I had another plan when I started typing it, but oh well. Always put your object in a variable and then write it. A couple of things. I've used named parameters in almost every case. I spelled out my commandlet names all the way. I spelled out my parameter names all the way. How many of you see scripts that use truncated parameter names? Just push tab for God's sake. It's not that hard. It's, it, you know it's a big key on the keyboard? Hit it. It's designed to take it. This is the right way to do it. The reason I always put this in a variable is because if you ever want to do any kind of custom viewing, custom views, formatting views, You need to do that, so you might as well put it in an object to begin with. Who knows what that's for? I'm changing the type name so that later, if I want to have a custom default view, I have something for that to trigger on. And I'll show you guys that if you want me to. In fact, really? I thought everyone knew how to do that. OK. Yeah, I'll show you. Show us everything. <laughs> what time is it? Um, this is this is going to be a little hokey, but let's get Win32 logical disk, computer name, computer, filter, device, uh, oops. Device ID equals C. Now, you got to be really careful when you start using these sim things. How many of you are used to WMI? You know they like renamed half the crap with sim. So I, I will tell you the one place all bugs come from is a bad assumption. You assumed that some property name had a value, and that's not what it had. So uh, check. Just check. Get sim instance win32 logical disk. As it is device ID. It is C colon. And I've got size and free space. So let's do this. Free space equals disk. What do I call it? Drive dot free space. Yeah. OK. How many of you think of disk space in bytes these days? What do you think of it? What's more common? Gigs. Megs, at least. But gigs, probably. Tools do one of three things. They either create input for other tools, they do stuff, which is what this one's doing, or they mangle output. They don't do any combination. You output in a tool, you output the rawest form of data possible. Because today, I might want to look at gigabytes, but tomorrow, it might be megs. And since there might be a difference, I'm going to do the rawest thing, and I'll let the next tool munge the output into something attractive. The output of a tool is either completely raw and usable in a variety of situations, or it is entirely attractive and meant for one purpose, like going in a report or on the screen. Not both. You can't have both. Mustn't have both. Mustn't. Um, so let me save this real quick. See, whatever, PS1. Uh, so really, custom views? You guys haven't done that? Who wants to see custom views? Oh, shit, all right. Your wish is my command. Uh, open a new file. 
immediately give it C view dot format. Here, let me make sure you get this. Dot PS1 XML. That's the file name extension. The reason you save the blank this way is because uh, the ISC will switch its color coding for you now. And uh, let's just go steal, let's repurpose, PS Home Notepad.net types. Wait a minute, you didn't copy. Copy. Paste. Take out that annoying copyright message. There, now we're not stealing. These are case sensitive, by the way. Well, that's not true. They're not case sensitive since version three, but they're case sensitive in version one and two, so I'm a little used to it. So this is the, the, the basic structure for a custom view file. Have you guys ever seen custom views in action? Yeah, every day. That's custom view, get process. You think there's actually a parameter called CPU parenthesis S? No. This is custom view. Do you think the underlying VM property is actually in megabytes? No, it's not. That calculation is done by this view. And I can prove it because if I actually look at the raw data, there it all is, it's all in bytes. So this is what I'm saying, your tools output raw data. You can use other tools to make it pretty. Well, so that's what we'll do. Let's go find, what do you want to do here? We've only got four properties. You want to make a table? Sure. Oops. Um, yeah, you can do a table view and you can also do a list view. Whatever one is first is the one that will get specified if you don't pipe your tool to a format command. Um, b due to discoverability reasons, there's not much point in having more than one view for any given data type, object type. Um, but you can give these things a name and you can use a format command to select a name of a view other than the first one it runs across. But there's no way to get a list of what's available. There's been a discoverability problem since day one. Um, so you tend to not see people do that. Uh, let's go find a table view we can steal. Here's one. No, that's not a long one either. Good. Copy. All your views get dumped in the middle here. Paste. Uh, we need to go get our custom object name, him. And that goes, well, what goes in name doesn't really matter much, but you tend to see to see that. Uh, and then we've got what? Computer name, OS version, free space, and BIOS serial. So let's call the first column. So this is our header section right here. So we'll have computer name. I'll let it auto calculate the width so we won't specify a width. Um, that's going to annoy me. OS version. Actually, let's just call it ver. And we'll let it auto calculate the width. No, we won't. We'll make it 16 just to show that we can do it. This is a column header that has no attributes, meaning it will use the underlying property name, um, which I'm fine with for the third and fourth column. Now I have to have a matching number of these. So the property name here is computer name. The property name here is OS version. The property name here will be BIOS serial. And what did I call the other one? Free space. Oh, that seems straightforward. Copy, paste, but I'm not going to refer to property name. Oops. We're going to put a script block. And we are going to take the object's free space property. and run it through the formatting flizz. Oops. Space holder zero, numeric two places. So we'll format it to a, because we're going to divide it by a megabyte or a gigabyte. What do you like better, gigabyte? Yeah. 
So then we might actually want to change our label for that one. Just so some schmuck doesn't think there's only like 10 bytes free. Oops. Paste. C free gigabytes. Uh, and you know what? Why don't we right align that? Because it's a number and it'll look pretty that way. Everybody get all that? It'll be in the recording. So here's how you use this. Update format data, append, whatever, view, and then run get-osinfo. Gotta hope that works. Nope. Oh, it'll always tell you. Oh, it doesn't know align. It might be alignment. Let me just take that out. It's a number, so it should right align it anyway. <coughs> Computer name, localhost. There. Uh, we'll sort out that in a sec. But this way I can get my custom layout. Now, I could have gone and, and messed around with the widths on these things to in a little bit. You can play with it a lot. Uh, let me see what I did wrong with. Um, format dash table minus wrap. It's the only way you have. It's not really best or worst. Yeah, it's just the only way it'll, it'll support it. Um, I'm not sure why it's not doing my script block. Unless I didn't have a free space. No, I did call it. Uh, no. No, I've, I've got this formula whack here. You know what? We'll, we'll do this the cheat way. There you go. Now, when you build a module out of something, you've got your PSM1 script file, right? But you've also got this .format.1ps, format.ps1xml file. So that's why you make a manifest, a .psd, new-module manifest. That says when you load this module, load this script and this view magically all together now so that when I run my commands, I get my defaults. But I can still, remember this formatting gets only applied at the end of the pipeline. I could still run that command, sort it, filter it using the raw data. The raw data is still there. It's just this screen display that's been altered for your perception. Neat trick. But what you want to be able to do is get flexibility. A tool that does something shouldn't worry about where its input comes from. Its input comes from parameters. Any way you've got of feeding me a string, I'll take as a computer name. Any way you've got of feeding me an object that has a CN or computer name property, I'll take it. Now, what you do with the output, that's up to you. CSV, HTML, select it, format it, do whatever you want but we keep all those functions separate. Well, yeah, but I, I, I need it to happen that way every time for this one process. I know. That's called a controller script. It's not a function. It might take input parameters because scripts can have a parameter block also, but this is now tied to a specific purpose. I'm gonna save this with a non-commandlet style name create csv report for server os info dot ps1 that's a controller that implements a specific process using a bunch of tools that i've created previously it's going to produce a report it's going to implement a server provisioning it's going to do whatever that's a controller tied to a specific purpose uses tools controllers should be easy to write because they shouldn't actually be doing anything novel. The tools do all that. 
controller script breaks, take the tools separately, test them individually. If the tools work, the controller works. You separate a lot of the cognitive load of debugging by keeping everything nice and tiny and small and tight, and then it becomes easy to reuse these. This idea of building tools, building tightly scoped commands that do only one thing, is why Microsoft is pumping out DSC resources so quickly. They've got thousands of commands that do stuff. They just need to utilize them for a specific purpose. A DSC resource is just another kind of controller script. It puts tools to a specific purpose. So follow that pattern. Questions? Answers? Comments. Like you, you look surprised when he hasn't worked with this. Oh, the views? Yeah. Yeah, I thought, every, yeah, I don't know. I, t I teach it all the time, so I just assume everybody else does. It's like I think what I do is I, I'm a pretty expert on about 25% of it. Yeah. Like that, I can do everything I need to do with that 25%, and I come to these so I can see what the possibilities are. Yeah. Now, the good news is everything mankind knows about those view files is in that book in front of you. There's a chapter. It's in my tool making book, but more from a tutorial perspective and not as exhaustive. We tried to document more of it in the in-depth book. So you've got it all. On the list of available attributes that you can set and format view in, in the um, Most of the ones in the book, yes. In the book. Yeah, they're not actually documented by Microsoft per se. We reverse. Um, yeah, um, everything. So back in version one, I reversed engineered most of this by going through the Microsoft files. Um, because they want the flexibility to dork with this, they won't publish a document type definition for the XML. And so we don't really know what the fully official supported list of everything is. But I went and found everything they actually used and figured it out and documented it. No. Nope. No. Nope. So we documented the whole thing for you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> that was exhausting. Um, no. This is one of the secret. This and, and you know there's a very similar thing called the extensible type system. So there's a very similar type of XML that you can use to add types, to add properties and methods and scripts. However, when you're creating the object yourself in a script, it would make a lot more sense just to add everything here than to have some stuff show up here and other stuff get added by an XML file. Um, they use the extensible type system to dress up .NET framework types that the PowerShell team is not allowed to actually change the source code of. What's an example of that? Oh, there's tons. Um, the perfectest example is this dude right here. Script properties are added by PowerShell because those bits of information are normally a little hard to get to. You have to run all these different little commands. And so they rolled that up into a script property. Um, alias properties, a process object doesn't actually have a name. It has a process name. But everything else has got a name. And there's a few PowerShell commands that look for a name property by default, like format wide. And so this is a way of giving it a name, which is simply the same as its process name. And then these, you know, PM, VM, WS, those don't exist either. Those are added by PowerShell's extensible type system. Uh, you can actually use get member um, to see the base object, the unadapted, the unextended object. Is to hang out with guys like Keith Hill and this is all they talk about. So yeah, cool stuff. So you like? All right, you, you know how to make it a module, right? You know how to turn this into a module? Save it in the right magic place with the right magic name? Because it's all just about file locations now. So let's do it with this one. File, save as. Um, 
There's a couple legal places. As of version four, program files makes the most sense. I'll talk about the other locations in just a sec. Let's just go into program files. Um, here's what everybody screws up if you've never done this before. Uh, make a folder. Whatever you call the folder is your module name. The file name has to match my tools.psm1. Now let's go save our view in there as well. That can be anything you want. Uh, come out here, CD program files, CD Windows PowerShell. Seriously. There we go. Modules, my tools. All right, so there's my two files. New module manifest, root module is your script module. Formats to process is whatever your view is. And this has to have the, the matching name, it has to be your module name, .psd1. Now, get module minus list available. A drum roll. There it is. And it has one command, get OS info. And now, I can run that and tab complete it. And it has my default view automatically loaded. That is neat, yeah? Works. No, um, in here by default, to make it easy on us, everything is automatically visible. Unless you start specifying a stuff that's visible, a list of stuff that's visible, in which case only the stuff you specify will be visible. So to make it easy by default, everything's public. Yeah, it's probably more of a process thing, right? If, if I'm the only one munging around with this, I tend to put related things into a module. I tend to think of them as units of distribution. Um, I try to have fewer files until my editor starts acting flaky, and then I'll start breaking it up. You got five different people working on components of a module, putting them in separate scripts that all get included together can just make the process easier. Correct. If you don't export something, it's private. Anything in the module can see it. Nothing outside the module can see it. When you created that manifest, that one listed the version number because I saw that. Yeah, it, yeah. You guys ever look at a manifest? They're not terribly sexy. Um, it just defaults to 1.0. There's a parameter, I could have specified a different one. Okay. There's parameters for all these. It makes up a GUID, it makes up an author, but there's parameters of the command. Uh, I was wondering about that because and this is another place you can make things visible or not. The module itself doesn't have to export anything. You can simply say only as you create the manifest, only export these. I find that to be a little bit more useful because when I want to debug, I can just rename the manifest to something that PowerShell won't find, like mess up the file name extension. It'll stop loading the manifest and then I can just start using the module naked. And then I put the manifest back on as a wrapper. Um, it is similar to a session configuration, kind of, sort of. Um, yeah. Talk about those later if you want to. I love remoting. I'll talk about that all day. Cool so far? Let's talk about error handling. Bless you. 
Please do not die in my class. Uh, oh, uh, okay. So central repository modules. Yeah. Modify that. Give it a UNC. Easiest way. This is the environment variable. Now you can't change this inside PowerShell. That'll only change it for that session. You change this group policy, one way to do it. Um, these are the paths where PowerShell looks for modules automatically. So if that's a UNC, then it'll look there too. And that's, this is the supported way. In fact, you'll notice um, SQL Server, when I installed my SQL tools, it added its module location to this. That is the preferred practice. Rather than dumping all your crap in System 32, which is owned by the operating system team, just tell PowerShell where else to look. Uh, no, you would set this as an environment variable in a DSC configuration. Uh, so yeah. Is that stored in the registry somewhere? Uh, it's an environment variable. So. It's like all the other environment variables. So like, it's just like the path environment variable. So you would manage it the same way, usually in a group policy. Mm -hmm. Or just on your session A, your profile, potentially? Um, no, I, I, would, I would, if I wanted this to happen every, on my computer all the time, and I didn't want it, I just wanted it on my computer. Um, hmm, Windows 8, interesting. Properties of the computer. Advanced system settings, um, environment variables. You, I just modify it here. PS module path is in here, right there. Edit, change it. I'm really impressed I was able to find that. Anything else? Pro files, yeah, program files is new in V4. I like it. I don't know why they didn't do that before. Um, I would certainly, in fact, most of the environments I worked in, they had already used a group policy to modify PS module path to include something in program files. Or if you were shipping your own product, you had your own. Or if you're shipping your own product, you would, you, as part of your installer, you would modify that environment variable to include your path. Yeah. So Oh no, that's you're meant to. That's that's for you. Yeah, that's the all user place. If you've got something that you just use yourself, it goes under Documents, Windows, PowerShell modules, which has been there. Um, but we didn't have an all user location. PowerShell only shipped with Documents and System 32. It's like either I work for Microsoft or it's private to me. Uh, so Program Files is the approved. Put all your stuff there, and that's where DSC modules go by default. Talk about er errors. Um, there are two schools of thought around error handling. One of them is wrong. And the wrong way is to do something and then see if anything happened. I don't like that. That's, that's the this. That's, uh, you know, OS equals get WMI object, win32 something. If OS not equal null, that's dumb. Um, I see that approach a lot. And I hate that approach. I hate it for a couple of reasons. One, that is completely undefined. There is no guarantee that every single command in the universe that fails will populate your variable with null. Some of them might stick a four in there because you just don't know. It's not reliable, it's not consistent. It's also not declarative. You're running a command and then you're examining something in the environment. You're not telling PowerShell that you expect an error. So I don't like that. Um, this is the other thing I don't like. 
I really hate that. Dollar sign question mark gets populated with true or false based on what the previous command told it to be. So if I give this a computer name that doesn't exist, if I run this, what do you think dollar sign question mark will contain? I don't know. I don't know if the command considers that to be a failure or not. Now I really don't know. There's no kinda. Were you successful? Maybe. So again, it's not declarative. Dollar sign question mark was really put there for when you're running external commands that set an error value on their return. And if they set it to zero, then that's true. Otherwise, if it's non-zero, that gets set to false. That's really what that was made for. Using this for general purpose error handling is not the right way to go. Um, this is not the right thing to do. <laughs> Sticking your head in the sand works for geopolitics, but it does not work well for computer programming. You're telling me, well, and I get into this with people, what, what's, why are you doing this? Well, because the only possible error stop. That is not the only possible thing that could go wrong. Many other things can go wrong in the universe, and I'd like to know about most of them in a nice, convenient error message, which you have just hidden from me. Put this setting on your children, <laughs> not in your scripts. So there is only one true good way to error handle, and that is to take a try block, wrap it around all the code, and give a catch block after it. So now, as soon as an exception occurs, PowerShell will leave the try and it will execute the catch. The problem is that most PowerShell commands don't throw exceptions. They throw, they spew error. This is not the same thing. In order to catch it, you need to shift the error action to stop for that command. I tend to take a somewhat conservative approach. I figure if the first query works, the other two probably will. And if they don't, I'd like an error message about it because something's wacky. If the first one works and one of the other two doesn't, I've done something wrong and I want to know. Similarly, if the first query doesn't work, it is highly unlikely that the second two will. So I just want to skip everything. I don't want to produce, I don't want to waste any more time querying. I don't want to produce any blank output. I just want to leave entirely and perhaps take the computer name and log it to a file. We'll, we'll get a little bit more advanced with that in a second. The only time this is the wrong approach is if you run across a command, and they exist, that does not throw terminating exceptions no matter what you do to it. Um, badly programmed commands. They all should. Many don't. Not many. A few. SharePoint. Anybody work with SharePoint? Really? Let's pick on them. <laughs> what a garbage piece of architecture. Let's treat SQL Server like a disk drive. Um, this will get you 99% of the time, okay? There's two things we have to talk about. Trapping and handling the error, which is what we've done, and capturing the error so that we know what went wrong. That's different. Now there's a few approaches here. One approach is to provide a different catch block for each type of thing that might go wrong. This requires that you know the .NET framework type of whatever went wrong. 
which usually means you have to sit and play with it and run the command a few times in various error situations so you can find out what the heck the name was. Uh, one of our free ebooks is The Big Book of PowerShell Error Handling. Dave Wyatt, the author, will be here this week. Hug him. First of all, it'll be funny. Second, <laughs> part of the book is an Excel spreadsheet that he's been populating with all the exception type names he can find. Thank him for that, because they're tough to track down sometimes. So if you don't actually care about what the error is per se, you just want to take a different action based on it, that is the declarative way to do so. You can have as many of those catch blocks as, as you want. The last one does not have a type associated, and it gets the leftovers. Another approach is to try and get the error into a variable. The built-in dollar error variable is always an array, and index zero is the last error that was thrown. You typically want to immediately capture that into your own variable, because if anything else happens, it's not going to be zero anymore. <coughs> dollar sign underscore at the top of a catch block will have the error that got you there. You always need to drag that into your own variable, because there are so many other things in PowerShell that hijack that you're likely to lose it. Or error variable lets you specify the name of a variable, and you're all aware that the name does not include the dollar sign, which is why I just put an X there without a dollar sign. And that will put the error into that variable. All three of these techniques result in completely different things. What you really want to get down to is a PowerShell error record object. Depending on the command, one of those approaches will work. Um, dollar sign error zero tends to be the most reliable. Dollar sign underscore is not bad. Kind of depends on the command, and it depends a lot on the situation. Big book of PowerShell error handling, Dave ran through all the permutations and kind of outlines what you get each way. What you do depends on what you want. Sometimes you just want a message. I just want text. I'm going to log it to a file, minus error variable. Sometimes you want to get an exception type so that you can do something different with it, and you'll probably have to do dollar sign underscore or dollar sign error. Depends a little bit on what you're after. But that's a good ebook to read. Uh, the name notwithstanding, it's not a big book. It's, it's only 20 or so pages. It's a quick read. Being aware that there are wrong ways, dollar sign question mark, testing for null. <laughs> right ways that are going to differ. That's the battle. It means you've got to test. Well, and if you write your own stuff, you should support that as well by throwing exceptions. Yeah, if you are going to write a tool and, and you do want to do that, then yes, you should throw an exception with the throw keyword. And that makes, because remember, I put commandlet binding at the top of this. I support minus error variable, and I support minus error action. I don't have to do anything about it. So long as I'm actually barfing an exception, PowerShell knows what to do from there. It's kind of neat. Uh, you can also, there is a, a difference between write error and throw. They'll do slightly different things in different circumstances. Again, you need to experiment in each tool to become comfortable with what they're doing in different circumstances. They're not exactly the same. Throw typically always throws a terminating exception no matter what you do. Right error usually throws an error that is consistent with the error action preference, which means it's non-terminating by default, but can be made terminating if your command is run with minus error action stop. A little bit more consistent, but they're different. Good so far? You look dazed. Just hungry? Lunch will be here soon. How does it work with like invoke command? How does lunch work with invoke command? Uh, or? A try <laughs> catch block around invoke command. Oh. Where you pass it through 50 computers at one time. 
Yeah, um, you need to do your error handling on the computer that's running the commands. Remoting is not particularly adept at dragging back exceptions. What if, you can't, what if one of the errors is you can't connect to the other computer? So if you're, if you're try catching invoke command, you're going to be catching exceptions of invoke command, which would be I can't connect to the computer. If you want to, if you want to handle exception in whatever is being invoked, that needs to go inside the invocation. Does that make sense? Like invoke, an error from invoke command will be I couldn't connect to the computer. Not, hey, I connected, I sent it your code, it ran it, and it exploded over there. That's not going to come back to you and become an exception of invoke command. Will, if you have multiple computers and you have multiple that you can't connect to, will they each throw their own errors? It depends. This is where your, your code logic becomes important. I connect to one, good. Two's offline. That would normally be a non-terminating exception, meaning error message, not trackable. I have said stop, I will never try three. So if you're going to be doing this, you need to, well, there's a couple things. This is a bit of a specific use case, but generally speaking, you only want to be operating against one object at a time so that if it explodes, you can handle it and then for each your way and then do the next object. So you would not try and get it to process multiple things. In this specific case, invoke command has an entirely different set of logic and how you could handle something like that. I might, for example, I might do that because that then gives me a job object for every single one of those computers. Job two can fail, but one and three can still proceed. And I can monitor that and I can find that out based on the job status. But to take invoke command out of the discussion for a little bit, because that's a special situation, let's say it's get WMI object. That is a bad pattern. That's a good pattern. Right, but those were running sequentially then. Yeah, they were going to run. They were going to run sequentially anyway. So I meant from the invoke command. If I yeah, well, because invoke command is special. You want to run it as a job, so that they can run in parallel, so that you can trap them individually. Did you put the error actually in the script log? He's talking about connecting to the computer being the error which is going to be thrown by invoke command, not by the code inside the script block. Invoke command is special because it involves remoting. When would you use a finally block? When would I use a finally block? No. Never. Okay. I know. It's, gonna do it to it's always going to execute whatever comes after the try block anyway. Yeah, do you know why that's there? Honestly, truthfully, you won't like the answer. Sure, it's going to destroy your childhood. <laughs> PowerShell has got a number of things in it called syntax sugar. They're keywords that are there not because they have any real reason or purpose in life, but because developers expect them to be because the developers are familiar with other C-based languages. And so someone approaching PowerShell, for example, looks for a return keyword. All return does is write to the pipeline and then exit. It's unusual for PowerShell functions to work against one thing. We normally want to write it to the pipeline and then keep working because we've got more things to do. But a developer coming in who wants to treat this as a C language needs a return keyword, and so it's there. Same thing with finally, because the, the standard ANSI specification for the language is try catch finally. like the 
code gets checked in, so it's looking at the version control information, stuff like that. What the date and time of the script executed, how long it took, et cetera. That would go in an end block. Finally, finally sits there. And if this runs, then this will run. If this runs, this will run. So if I put, if I put that there, that's going to run whether there was an error or not. Thing is, so is that. Structurally, there's not a lot of, of purpose for it. This isn't the same as an end. Well, I don't need I don't need end because it's empty. But if I was going to do clean up work, it goes in my end block. That's not the same as finally. But we can't get rid of end. No, need that. Anything else? Questions? Answers? Anyone care for a mint? Who's hungry? Chris, are we good? Is that a hungry or a mint? All right. Uh, let's eat. Um, let's come back at 1 o'clock.